Please join me in welcoming Tom Oser, CEO at Pipeline Strategies Consulting, and Melanie Wilson, Chief Financial Officer at National Independent Automobile Dealers Association. They will be speaking on the topic, how far and how fast should we go with electrification? Please give them a round of applause. Thank you. The way we'll divide the time up, um, I'll give 15 minutes of commentary, and, and so will Melanie. And then we'll open it up to, uh, to joint conversation. And um, so this is going to be a rapid, a rapid fire rendition of a talk that I, I give on uh, future of tr transportation. And we're kind of like dividing it down into looking at autonomy. We've talked about autonomy today. Um, and yesterday in, in several different aspects. But autonomy as, um, as a, a motive for uh, electrification and how far, how fast. So pleased to engage that with you. So first, we'll go back to some, some first principles and perspectives. People talk about the sharing economy. Well, we've, we've been sharing in transportation for a long time. I love this, this scene from Grand Central Station. Um, many of you probably have been, been there before and to modern day higher capacities. My favorite toll booth, this is the Beijing to Macau toll booth. It, toll booth, it's 50 lanes wide, and the average velocity here is about zero. If you can see at the top, there's a little bit of a return lane there. There's two or three lanes going back the other way. Those are the people who didn't lose their vehicles gambling in Macau. And then in LA, we have the same thing, only we have a different perspective on it. We look at, we look at uh, the traffic jams as an opportunity to work on our aspirational jobs, dancing and performing. But the burning platforms that we talk about is that the, the aggregate miles driven is just on a juggernaut. We're up to, well, we were prior to, um, prior to the economic downturn in 2008 and then the very recent downturn in COVID, I kind of added uh, a nosedive from 3.2 .2 trillion miles driven, it's back down to the, 2000, uh, the year 2000 level of about 2.7 trillion aggregate miles, all miles driven. But that's going to bounce back up very quickly. And I can tell you, traffic is back in, in Los Angeles, at least, if not everywhere else that we live. And so the congestion is back too. We recall major cities around the, around the world. Los Angeles, uh, the, average, the average person in Los Angeles spends about 100 hours in congestion a year. And what that translates to is $20 billion in lost economic activity or sanity. And then the gigatons of carbon increasing looks a lot like, uh, well, I guess energy is a problem. There we go. Um, the gigatons of carbon emissions. We have an, uh, is this something I'm doing or? Hands free, okay. Um, is exponentially growing. And perhaps just for the fun of it, this week in Seattle even, this might reflect the temperatures growing as, as a proxy for um, global warming and perhaps, uh, perhaps some um, ecological, uh, ecological environmental issues that we're all concerned about. In Los Angeles, about 30 to 40% of the real estate is allocated to automobile traffic, to the vehicle traffic. The interstates, the roads, the highways, the parking lots, it's, um, it's just amazing. Cars are the second largest capital expense, 38,000 average new, 25,000 now for the average used car, 4%, these assets utilized 4%. This is disruption waiting to happen. We all know this. These are the st statistics that we repeat all the time together. The path forward, is it going to be a gradual burn, a, a gradual and continuous burn, or will we have a disruption along the way? Well, we're on the verge. Real change is about to occur. And then we have to, we have to tease out what's real and what's hype. We talk about autonomous capabilities of cars to, to give us back efficiency in our lives. And, um, Safety, you know, the, the, the challenge, of course, is that statistically autonomous vehicles are going to be far safer, but we will not forgive one human life lost to an autonomous vehicle while we tolerate tens of thousands of losses when we're engaged ourselves as humans and we forgive each other. 
We're not gonna forgive that robot, but we kind of like give each other a break because we know stuff happens. Innovative disruption. Everyone talks about I'm starting a business and we're being disruptive. Really? Tell me how and tell me how it's gonna be adopted. Shared economics and on demand for ownership and electric vehicles, the ultimate story. So what's the rise? Autonomous vehicles can see. Autonomous vehicles can think with AI. We've been talking about AI several times today. Autonomous vehicles can sense. When you look at them, they've got big, ugly ears. Their eyes are a little bit screwy. They, they could take a starring role on orange is the new black. But they're going get, to they're, they're get a package that you can put on all vehicles in a standard way. And we'll get used to, get used to the look of that. And so then the promise is transportation as a service, ride sharing. The assets that we ride in will go from 4% utilization to 40%. Think about the economic uh, benefit there, 10 times. The car's capacity, instead of just driving 10,000 a year, they'll be driving 100,000 miles per year. That's a 10x opportunity. Gas to electricity, $15,000 in gasoline down to about $1,500, $1,600 in um, electricity an improvement of 10x. And the powertrains from maybe 100,000 miles to 500,000 miles for the warranty that they're willing to give the warranty on, about a 5x. 10x is the capital raising goal to say, if you have a 10x improvement, that's gonna be adopted by the marketplace. So by all of these measures, we should all be driving autonomous vehicles in no time at all because I see 10x is up and down the board of what's promised on the technology. Disruption, not so fast, not so fast. Here's a list, you can look this up in the New York Times, but over a century, you'll see the telephone started out there in and around the late 1800s, and you follow that dotted line, if you can do that, I can't do that, I don't have my glasses on, but it, it follows up, it, it drops out at the depression, and it takes about 100 years to get to 90, 95% of the population. That's the diffusion of a new technology into a population. That's how human beings adopt it. Notice the cell phone. The cell phone started out in and around the, the mid to late uh, 80s, and within 20 years, it reached uh, fantastic. So we have this acceleration of, of adoption of technology across the population. That's because it's on a platform. To make it relevant to automotive, there's the automobile back in the early 1900s, kind of, um, toward the Great Depression, took a little bit of a nosedive, but it took about 100 years to, to really get to the majority of the population. But notice these other technologies, and these are, in some, in some fashion, automatic transmission, disc brakes, radial tires, power steering. Look at from zero to 100% of the cars coming out on the line, these technologies were adopted in vertical timeframes, a couple of years. Why is that? Why is that? because we had already adopted a platform known as the automobile that we, we've already bought into. Now, these were innovations that saved lives and so forth, but they were accepted because they came in on a platform ready for us. So what is this saying about adopting technologies? This is the famous crossing the chasm curve, and that is way over on the left, about 2.5% of our population are enthusiasts. They'll take any technology just because it's different, and they don't care whether it works or not because just the idea that it could is enough for them to use it. Then you'll have the visionaries, the early adopters that are willing to work on it with their engineers to make it work for their business because they know, they know no one else is going to have it. We'll be the first to market, and we think that we're going to win in the market. But it's after those 16% of the population that you have to cross the chasm into the population of normal thinkers. And those are the, the pragmatists say, it's better, I'm willing to work with it a little bit, and you can get to half the population. This is, this is the way people think and act toward technology. And so a guy named Everett Rogers, about 50 years ago, or perhaps a little bit more, came out with five factors that have to be dealt with when you think about the adoption and the diffusion of technology through the population, through an organic population of thinking human beings, let's say. Relative advantage. Am I, what is the relative advantage of using the new technology compared to what I was doing before? Compatibility. Am I gonna have to throw out everything that I had before to use the technology and or my behaviors? Am I going to have to change my behaviors? Is it compatible? The complexity. 
Can the man on the street use it, or do I need a rocket scientist to deal with it? Trialability, can I get into it and use it? Observability, can I see my neighbors using it, people that I admire, and I want them to go first before I do? And so here's what it looks like across the world. This data is a little bit, data might be about a year old, but it shows that right now, in terms of the populations, the US, we're probably somewhere in the low 1% of the vehicles we drive in electric, and uh, elect electric vehicles. This is the electric piece. This is not the autonomous piece. This is the electric piece. Norway is at about 35%. Remember what that means. They've gotten over the chasm. Why is that? Because the Norway government decided we're going clean energy and we're getting rid of internal combustion engines. They decided as a government and as a population that they were doing this. And so they've, they've crossed the chasm. I think there's more Teslas over there in Norway operating than any particular major city in, in the US. So electrification is the core. And the things that were, were brought up earlier today is the grid. Now, I'm living in LA. I'm living in LA for about 10 years. I remember the Enron deal. I was living in Dallas back in the Enron days. And I had, a, I had a friend who was in energy trading, and I watched what they did to California with all those derivatives. In California, we're paying more money for electricity than, than wa water and food itself. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. But the grid, the power, and all the step downs that were talked about earlier by our buddies from Cornus and so forth, 75% of the energy that's generated is being dissipated in, in, in heat and waste on the way toward, toward consumption. This is a big, big issue. And hence, the issues of getting distributed energy and storing it locally and not allowing it to dissipate in, in, in loss, uh, heat loss and, and transmission loss. They could always talk to Texas. And they could always talk to Texas. We're great. We're great. I was thinking that, no, I'm, I'm going to tease her because I did live in Texas. I was a damned Yankee. That meant I came to Texas to live there and I stayed. So you're a damn Yankee. But I left, so I just became a Yankee again. And we were just talking about how wonderful Texas was this winter with its free market electricity that wouldn't pay the extra 15% to guard against the, well, they did. They may have met the 100-year storm, but what they didn't realize that we're having the 1,000-year storm this year. That's the, piece That's the piece free market economics doesn't pay for. But here's the thing. Besides the electrification of all the cars that I have to decide, am I going to change my behavior to charge my car every night because I play that gas gauge to F to E? I, I have days, sometimes weeks. And even when it gets to E, I'm playing the game, can I make it or not? You know, that's my behavior. I don't know if I can deal with plugging the car in every night. But there are other claims on electricity. Water desalination, I'm telling you, I'm living in California, I'm concerned, I'm on the wrong side of the country right now. There's no water, there's less water now than there was when I moved in at the drought in the beginning of the 2010s. Summer peak power balances, winter peak ba power balances in, in, in Texas. Now, now the thousand year storms are showing up and we have a still not so smart grid um, and we don't have a consistent grip on it because of the regional policy differences. So who's going to come first? Well, perhaps it's not every consumer. Perhaps it's going to be fleet management. And I wish Greg were here, the man who's remanufacturing the fleets, because I told him, I said, hey, I have a slide that's right up your alley. I said, what has to happen to a fleet in order to replace it? And if Greg has his way, who's talked about, he's going to remanufacture those, those fleets and, and drive them again. So here's a man who's going to keep in, in internal combustion engines on, on the road because it very well may be the right thing to do for the, for, for the foreseeable future. And then Airbnb, you can't see this, but what's on the screen right now are all the logos of Airbnb, Bird, Lyft, Postmates, and so forth. These are, these are the sharing business model. I can't even see it now. So I'm completely flying blind, which is good. It's close to the last, close, close to the last slide. Um, and then, but the question is, are we going to be part of the sharing economy and go into that dark night willingly? Because autonomy is an American's middle name. 
and you are going to have to pry the car keys out of my cold, dead hand. That's a Texas phrase. You're going to have to pry the car keys out of my cold, dead hand because I want to go out on the open road. I want to be in control of my own destiny, particularly on the weekend when I don't have to work. And that's a social change that's going to have to be, that's going to have to be dealt with. So I'm going to stop there. Oh, well, I'm going to stop here. So the question is, is, is the future now? Well, it's, we have to discuss this. Autonomous driving is inevitable, but is it universal? I like what was talked about in the ports, in very constrained environments. I think it's going to be really hard to get, get me to act rationally and give way to an autonomous vehicle that I know is going to have to stop when I step out into the traffic, whether the light is green or red. The autonomous vehicle is going to have to stop. I don't think it's going to work with me in the road with them as a human being. Innovative disruption, only if it's adopted. Think about the, fa the, 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 the Rogers five factors and the complexity and so forth. And the shared, shared economics, all these things are great, but electrification is the core issue, how, how far and how fast. I'm going to now give the podium over to Melanie, who's going to talk about some of the challenges to, that we're going to have to overcome. All right, thanks. Thank you. Surprisingly enough, I'm not very technologically advanced, so I wouldn't be surprised if this quits on me, too. Um, so one of the things that I, I love what he had to say, now you know why I let him talk first, because he really knows what he's talking about in this venue, but I always like to bring it back to where are we right now, and how realistic is it that we're going to get there very quickly? If you talk to people in this industry, it'll be anywhere from we're going to be autonomous in two years to no, it's going to be 20 years before we get there. And I think that... A lot of that depends on what issues we're focusing on and how we're addressing those with solutions before we can determine how long it's really going to take us to get there. Um, so one of the things that I think is a, is a key barrier to um, EV mass production is mineral supply and demand. So aside from, you know, we have the costs, we've got the restraints and inventory being available and things like that. But we have all of these new materials, raw materials that are needed to build these batteries that are going to go in the EVs. And if you uh, look at Bloomberg NEF, they estimate that the demand for nickel alone from 2018 to 2030 will be 15 and a half times what it is in 2018. That's a lot of nickel. Um, aluminum and copper could be 10 times greater. I mean, even at the lowest level on this graph, two and a half times the demand of what it was in 2018. Then you add to that that China currently controls 80% of the lithium production in the world. The UK, if you look, essentially has none. Um, and the US hasn't even tapped into what they have in reserves. So we have a a long way to go in the mining industry to catch up with what's going to be needed for these batteries. So the theory is batteries have to get down to a reasonable price, $75 per kilowatt, and that'll happen by the back end of this decade, and that's what's going to make electronic, electric vehicles really consumer friendly. You'll be able to have cost parity and to the internal combustion engines, and it really becomes a thing that you can move forward. <clears throat> But, ooh, I'm sorry. That was not the slide I was expecting, but it is the right slide. The right slide. It is, yeah. So we need this battery cost to come down. So to do the lower cost on batteries, you've got to have this mining industry that is really up to 15 times moving more pr product to the market so that they can create these, these barriers. And that's not impossible, but battery factories also have to catch up because they're going to need to build on economies of scale. Um, we're going to need to have some technological breakthroughs, and ideally, we would get to the highly sought-after solid-state chemistry for these batteries. So the last point I want to make about minerals is this is a limited resource just like oil. So if we go into this without a plan to recycle these batteries, then we're not going to only be just creating sustainable cars. We're going to turn around and have batteries that have nowhere to go. And right now, it's very expensive to recycle a battery. The process is very drawn out. You've got to break it all the way down. Um, but once we figure that out, then we'll be able to not depend solely on mining new materials, but being able to take these materials out of the batteries and reuse them in new batteries. And then you kind of get past the whole, we've got to 
mine all of these things because they start becoming available in the regular market. Someone talked earlier about the chip shortage and semiconductors and how bad the COVID-19 pandemic had an effect on that. And the, those semiconductors are equally as important to the ISEE vehicle, vehicles now as they will be to electric vehicles. And when you talk about semiconductors, you talk about cobalt, which I don't think was on my graph, but 50% of that is in a very unstable environment in the Congo. And then the COVID-19 pandemic stalled production of those so badly that GM and Ford had to shut down because they didn't have just semiconductors. So these, these minerals that come into play, it's a, it's a big problem that we're gonna have to figure out how to get around. But I think even bigger is infrastructure. So when you talk about infrastructure for EVs, you're not just talking about um, the roadways and, and all of that you're, and how far they can go in range. You're talking about like charging stations, right? So according to the National Petroleum News, there are currently 135,000 outlets supporting 1% of the vehicles on the road. So we have 1% of electric vehicles on the road and 135,000 outlets. I don't know if you've seen the news, but Tesla's will have lines like the Costco lines out the door trying to charge a vehicle. And in comparison, we have 1.4 million gas pumps to, to service the other 99% of vehicles on the road. But when you think about it, it takes five minutes to pump your gas. It takes, at best, 25 minutes to charge your car. So you have these charging stations that range from level one to level four, Ooh. and they all have different capital and operating costs, increasing with each level, but you need the level fours because no consumer is going to spend 20 hours sitting in a parking lot at a charging station for the cheap charging seat. That's for your home or maybe even a hotel. But you wanna talk a little bit about charging stations and their economies of scale. So economies of scale with charging stations peak at about four to six charging stations per setup. So it's very, very expensive. At one, it starts to come down, and at four to six, you lose any economies of scale. So when you look just simply at the install of the charging station, a level two charging station, which on our last graph, it was about four hours to charge, is pretty inexpensive. It's six or $7,000 to put in. But it takes four hours to charge the car to full, and they, there are these capacity charges, which I'll talk about in a minute. If you want to get to level three and level four, which talking from a consumer standpoint is really where you have to be, that's 25 to 40 minutes to be able to charge your car. I don't know what 40 minutes I have in a day, but I guess I would find it. Those are $50,000, $100,000 to install. And over long-term use, they end up with the capital expenditures being cheaper to operate but you're talking about an initial investment, so if I'm gonna put six level four chargers in, I've gotta drop $600,000 right now to put these in, plus maintain them going forward. And what's really crazy is the capacity chargers, or the, the capacity charges from the electric grid, okay, so we, we pump these things in to the electricity grid, as he was talking about, and the electricity company comes by and they say, okay, well, we're going to figure out at your highest peak what electricity you might need. And then we're gonna turn that into a monthly recurring cost. And we're gonna build that to you every month, whether or not you, you ever hit that high capacity peak. So if you think about a station that may have a couple of level twos, a couple of level fours, a couple of level threes, the energy company is gonna charge you for a car sitting on that level two for 20 hours or four hours or whatever it is, whether or not you actually have a car plugged into it, when it's clear that consumers will pay for convenience, so even if it's more expensive, they're going to go to the level three and the level four. So you've got a level two sitting there that was super cheap to install, but you're paying more for it. And it ends up being like $1,200 a month to to operate this level two that 
may or may not really be effectively used. That's just the baseline cost, plus than what you actually use. So the last thing I really want to talk about is um, we, we talked about the government needing to get involved. So Norway, was it, has 35% of electric vehicles on the road. And the way that they did that is the government said, we're going to come in and we're just going to make this change and that's just going to be what happens and you get past that. Well, we're not too far from something like that. Biden has $174 billion in his infrastructure plan specifically for electric vehicles. And about $600 million of that is coming from 18 different government agencies, including the General Services Administration and the United States Postal Service, to begin shifting their fleets over to electric vehicles and to build the infrastructure. Knowing what we know about the numbers we just talked about, we have 135,000 charging stations, which are serving 1% of the cars on the road, kind of poorly, if we're honest. You wonder with 600 million, can we actually change the fleets of the United States Postal Service, the General Services Administration, all of these, even if you only change the federal government fleets? and afford to build infrastructure that makes sense because they're probably not going to be able to do, well, let's go plug into the wall at the post office and let's hope that it's charged up by the next morning. It's just a lot of money. So you're going to switch all these fleets over and have federal vehicles with not enough infrastructure, but we're supposed to adopt this across the country without any formal plans or really any money for people to come in and build. It's gonna to have to be private investors who are willing to build these gas stations, gas stations, um, <laughs> with significant funding. They're gonna need significant amount of money to not just install them, but then also to run them. Um, and you've got at one point, I guess they said 7% of the vehicles will be electric by like 2030. I think that's right, 7.5% or something. Um, so 7.5%, we're going to have to seven times the number of charging stations that we have to poorly service all of those vehicles with the cost like what we talked. And then the last note before I'll let you comment is right now electric vehicles don't put any money into the highway trust fund. So this highway trust fund is what gas taxes come in to pay for roads and infrastructure across. It's kind of a huge deal because the electric vehicles are using the cars and roads, but they're not actually paying into any of this tax. So gas trucks and gas cars are all paying this gas tax, but the electric vehicles aren't. So if the administration really is going to push us into the electric vehicle adopted across the board, we really have to sit back and talk about the basics first of who's pitching in, how are we gonna pay for this infrastructure, and is it fair, really? It's, never mind, it was a bad joke. <laughs> um, is it fair for them not to pay their fair share? It's a good line whether it's a joke or not. It was terrible, it was a really bad no, joke. I like, got through in my head and I was like, this isn't a good idea, you shouldn't say that. Yeah. So that's what I have to say. I'm a, mon I'm a money girl, so I think about, you know, $600,000 for a gas station. So. It's interesting when you said, the thing that struck me about the statistic that you said, that the target of this 174 billion mm -hmm. toward- Infrastructure in oh, general. Oh, infrastructure in general, mm -hmm. but six, was it 600 million toward EVs? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, with an aspirational model that maybe by 2030, we could count on 7% of the population being electric vehicles. Right. So if you think about what that means, we're still way in the early visionary stages of, of crossing the chasm in a, in a population of normal, you know, n normal human being population where you've got the uh, technical enthusiast and then the, the visionaries in, in business. That's only halfway through the visionaries uh, element of the, uh, of the population. Right. And that's, that's pretty challenging. That's, that's pretty challenging. And you have to wonder what roadblocks you're going to run into because no administration is in office for that long. So as we, as we, we've been seeing for the last several decades. <laughs> right. been seeing for the, so if you have um, two sides of the coin and one supports it and one doesn't, you're going to come into these setbacks where 
this, this administration set this ball moving forward, and then someone else comes in behind them and says, yeah, well, that's not really a priority anymore. So I think what you said about Norway was really striking because without government support and almost mandate to do it, you really have a bumpy road ahead of getting people on board to move in the same direction because it's just inconsistent in telling people out there what the priorities are. So when you, when you said that the part of the plan there is to roll it out through the GSA and the U.S. Post Office, I'm thinking about what more dangerous an organization than the U.S. Post Office because the U.S. Post Office has to go to every zip code regardless of the preparedness of that zip code to need or even want electric vehicles, or even if they wanted it. So the, there's, there's, again, go back to those Rogers, those Rogers five factors, is the compatibility of the idea into the population that you're gonna to try to, to deliver the technology, they just, they just might not be ready in certain zip codes, and, well, that's, and we know that to be darn, darn true. Well, I mean, a gas station is a profit center just like everything else, and you're not going to go set up this very expensive charging station in a small town in East Texas with a population of 300 who may have one electric vehicle regularly there, but probably isn't really traveled through. It's not a main thoroughfare, but as you said, the post office still has to go, so then what the post office is going to invest all of those dollars to build that charging station for the two post trucks that run that town? That, that's, a that's a tough circle to square, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, really, it's really tough. And so I wonder, why don't we open it up to the, to the audience here? Yeah. Where is, where do you see dense population acceptance, either private or, or business, where do you see significant um, incursion of, electric, uh, of electric vehicles being possible, given that not all people are created equal in terms of being ready to adopt electricity? Yeah. Both of you did an excellent job in stimulating our thinking. Uh, just a note of observation, considering Norway, not only it was amended by the government, but they subsidized electrical cars so much so that it's cheaper to buy an electrical car than a regular gas car. So it was really an incentive that drove the behavior. And that's human. I mean, as humans, we know incentives work. Yeah. Uh, coming back to your issue about you know, the government, all the cars and all the slogans, politicians make slogans, uh, sound bites, because they are not held accountable for it. They're not going to be around in 2030, 2050. And even CEOs sometimes talk about sustainability and green energy and everything. But 2030, 2035, I've known a couple of CEOs who make that claim. They're going to be there. But nobody's held accountable for it. So that's the thing. There's no accountability in the decision. The market decides itself. Coming back to your Rogers factors. Uh, they can predict whatever they want. And the reason they're talking about government fleets is because the taxpayers pay for it anyway. So it's already subsidized. So. There's no change of behavior. But when was the last time a government ran a project that really made sense economically? So we all know that. Uh, coming back to thinking, I've seen some presentations where the EV cars would work very well in retirement communities, mm -hmm. okay, like yeah. in Florida, other places, a large community where people move around, socialize and everything, and they can have EV cars running over instead of buses and in a control environment where it's much more disciplined. And I think those are incremental steps one has to take uh, as people get comfortable with the technology and a lot of other issues are taken care of. And I think uh, there are opportunities in uh, dense population uh, cities, but again, with the, with the human factor interaction, it has to be a control environment. Uh, so that's, uh, I mean, I don't know. It, it's gonna take a while. Yeah, when you think about, you think about the, the history and the development of the railroad across the United States you know, over, over a century. You know, when it first came out, um, trains came right through the middle of town, right through the town square at street level, killing the kids. And, it, you know, the, the railroad was a, was a moral issue um, until we learned that, 
you know, if we want mass transit using these big behemoths, um, we have to understand as human beings, we have no business stepping in the environment where that autonomous vehicle is driving. And once, once we move the railroad out of the accessibility of most of the population, and we, we, still, we still kind of shake our heads with amazement at railroad crossings, the guards are down. And how many, how many human beings drive around the guard because they know better, and then you see the car swept away. It just happened, you know, in, in the I last mean, couple of weeks. It, it, on it's YouTube. going to happen, absolutely. Yeah, it's what happens. And, and so this is, this is, I think, what we, we need to deal with on the autonomous side. I've been, I've been in autonomous vehicles since DFW opened up that long four-mile strip of a north-south air, airport, and they, I forget who the, I think it was Rockwell International built an autonomous tram between yeah. all the terminals. That was back in the 1980s. We've had autonomous vehicles for a long time. That has the characteristic, as a human being, you can't get on that track in, in front of it. So we have to rethink the things that we know are true. I just wanted to note, on your Rogers factors, I'm trying to think, uh, where did safety come into picture? Because I've been preaching on innovation that it has to be safe to use, otherwise it not, doesn't get adapted uh, technology-wise. So within your five factors, there was some compatibility or something like that, the last two ones? Oh yeah, complexity, compatibility. The last two ones uh, were trial ability, and that is, that is my ability to try the thing out before I invest in the technology. Okay, so the safety comes in. Observability is, can I see people that I respect or are of like mind that I can see others using it successfully? And that will get the latter half of the population to adopt. That makes sense. If people accept it, that means people it's safe. Right, so, right. So I can observe that I'm not, I'm not, and that's what happens in the second half. It's the, it, it's the uh, conservatives the, yeah. and the laggards. They want to know they want the VCR out of the box just to work. They don't want to deal with the blinking 12, you know, the, the 12 o'clock midnight. Mm -hmm. And that, that, was the, that was the biggest thing. So people want to observe that it's safe, that it's usable, and I don't have to think about it. It's just that that's, that's the second half of the population, and that's a realistic thing. Right, this is going to be a challenge for all of us, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen, but it's going to go through some speed bumps when it happens. So Definitely. I really and, appreciate it. And when, the elect and when the electricity is down, for a couple of days this winter in Dallas, in California in summer, as we have rolling brownouts, or we intentionally shut the grids down in Northern California to avoid transmission lines blowing down and starting wildfires. You know, it's, it's that's safety issues, the complexity of, of the things that you have to deal with coming and, up. And, and adapting to it. Yeah. So. Adaptability. Thank you. And on alternative. Yeah. Other, other questions, other, other points? Yes, I, I want to go back to our buddies from Corners because they opened up this issue about the, the grid and so forth. So I hope it's on the grid. <laughs> it's around there. Oh. Um, my question is, um, I know we could talk about a bunch of different things. We could talk about energy as a service, what Montgomery County did, um, where you had a municipality partner with a utility um, where the utility started building the infrastructure um, and they offset the cost. Um, and that's a really cool conversation where, you know, that could work to help adoption. Um, but because of who you guys are and what you guys just spoke of, my question is, is we have a cultural fundamental problem with taking a step back when we commit to a decision. And do you find anything in this ecosystem, in, in this world of creating more electric vehicles, of needing to put in more chargers, of needing more transmission and distribution and storage, um, security, all these different elements, do you think that there is an area that we can postpone that we can pull back in a way that doesn't cut off our nose to spite our face, if you will? Hmm. Okay. That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> I do agree. I think that once we get on this path, we just feel like, especially the leaders in the pack, feel like we just got to bulldoze ahead because taking some time to pause and step back and figure it out 
feels like um, a little bit like failure, and, and I, had, I had to stop and move forward. I think if there's any space that we're going to pause, um, I think it's probably in this idea that this has to be a mass adoption ac across you know, every avenue of what it is right away that when it becomes a really viable option that is, is truly sustainable among all aspects of battery life and recycling and all of that, that it doesn't have to be an overnight shift in thinking because it's gonna take time for, like his grid showed, for, for people to get on board. And I think sometimes when we get wrapped up in these conversations, it's that, oh, we need everybody to adopt this all at one time when really it's probably fine if, it's a slower pace, and, and I would venture to say that it might speed up the movement through that curb if we just let it be a slower pace, because the back half of that curve is the most reserved on whether or not they're gonna make the move. So the longer time they have to see it in a smaller population work, the more like they may move quicker through that process of coming on board rather than having this big jump up to the top of the curb and then it takes you, you know, two decades to get the back half to jump on board. What she said. <laughs> and, then, and then building upon that, um, I was speaking to somebody earlier today at lunch is that the challenge is that there's so much stupid money available today. In the capital markets, there is just an enormous, enormous amount of money to be invested. And so venture capitalists are living, are living the dream, a lot of dry powder ready to invest, and they'll invest in anything. Anything that looks like a market that's moving, because why not? There's just so much money, there's cheap money and capital to invest in, in anything. And that's, that creates a state of stupid money. Once you've got that stupid money, then bad ideas can be promoted along with the solid ones. And, and one of the tactics of stupid money is invest and get out in front of the parade and then advertise as if it's already realized. And then you get people believing that, oh, I don't want to go to Phoenix because there are, there are autonomous vehicles driving all over the place running people down at night because of the, the hype in the market about where the technology is and that somewhere else it's, it's already operational and it's just a matter of time which person, Waymo or Tesla or whoever, is going to be the first in the market with a level five autonomy right out of the showroom and you'll be, you'll be like this, going down the road, taking, taking your nap. And so there are people today, and you see it on, on YouTube and on the news, every week or so, people are getting arrested, driving their Teslas from the back seat. Because they're already taking on, they're already taking on the fact of stupid money saying what's already true that's not even close yet. Because you can get away with it. You can drive in the back of a Tesla on a pretty well-mapped road, and you're going to have a pretty good chance of getting there alive and, and coming home again. And that's, so I think, I think the thing to, we're not going to step away from it because we're an open market economy. And what we do again and again, if you look at the, that wireless communications marketplace, the United States intentionally, because we love competition so much, we had AT&T and Qualcomm on one standard and Verizon and Sprint on another standard for 20 years, and the Europeans created GSM, the international standard that the rest of the world built to. And then finally, once all of the venture capital worked its way out and people realized that the world was taken off without us, the, the, the free marketers in the US, AT&T and Verizon and Qualcomm, everyone got together and said, yep, we gotta go GSM. Because if we don't rationalize, the rest of the world is gonna go and we're not gonna be able to, to, to deal with the rest of the world. So the thing that we can step back from are the, are the statements that were already there, and if you're not driving uh, our autonomous vehicle with your kids to work today, 
then you're, you're way, way behind. So I think, I think that's what we need to step back from. And that is, and I think what happened after the, the person got um, killed in, in Phoenix is that Waymo and the rest of them pulled back from the market and stopped allowing smack to be talked about what was possible and not because that wasn't the technology's fault. But they took the hit for it because they allowed the hype to say, we're ready to go. And no matter what you did, the first cycle until they figured out that the human wasn't doing the test the right way and she was re responsible and it wasn't the technology. And so that's what we need to step back from, is the hype and the believing that it's there and get to the fleet that has the environment to perfect it. And then take the results from there and expand it out and expand it out. And I don't know where those bets are. The people in this room are the experts. Yeah, you know, on that point, I think you're spot on. I think, first of all, the great presentation. I thought you guys did a terrific job. But, I, you know, I wonder, it'd be good to get your thoughts on, do we see autonomy um, kind of in the developing in these unique pockets, these aisles of autonomy? And perhaps in uh, within those markets, it's um, folks that either don't want to own a vehicle or have a uh, just a short-term need that are using Uber or Lyft today. Um, and if you're already trusting somebody to, you know, drive you and you're really not paying attention, would that be adapted more so in replacing car sharing as we know it today? And maybe that's the starting point in those kind of pockets of those aisles of autonomy. I don't know exactly where those would be, but where, you know, there would be less perhaps need for personal car ownership. Because if I'm gonna own a car and have access to it, I'm gonna to wanna to drive it. If I don't have access to a car, I really don't care who drives it. And if I don't have a need for a car uh, full time, I really don't care who drives it. So it's gonna be just interesting to see, does it adopt in a fleet or ride sharing aspect first? I, I, logically, that seems to make sense, but we'll, uh, we'll no see. Yeah, I think um, there was someone on the first day who was talking about how this stuff has to be developed in areas where it's safe. So you're going to see the, the pockets and where the people aren't. Um, and then this autonomy begins to develop from there. And then it's delivering your groceries. And then I absolutely think that the first step is probably a ride share where I can get on my app and choose, do I want a driver or do I want an autonomous vehicle to pick me up? And and then it, you'll have this gradual shift over to, you know, it's only an autonomous. And if I'm driving myself, I own my own car or I'm sharing with someone. But I definitely think I could see the car sharing as we know it transforming once this kind of catches up. You know, and I think, too, that some of those autonomous vehicles could be used to deliver a product from point A to point B, not just in the trucking sector or, you know, not just uh, necessarily last mile deliver um, goods businesses, but just to hot shot and move products. And, you know, we're actually having conversations with uh, autonomous um, uh, outfit that happens to be in Phoenix that might be able to move some of our products store to store. And so it might not even just start with passenger movement. It might also, um, or in tandem, um, work with, with product and just moving goods. Well, Domino's, I think, is testing delivering Domino's. their pizzas with autonomous vehicles. I think yep. the grocery stores are starting to figure out, can we deliver groceries autonomously rather than with people, which would be great because I don't know if you tried to Kroger pick up lately, but no one's at work, so you can't. There you go. No, I, 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 buy, in, I buy into that. Uh, I loved earlier today the, the Vera, the Volvo Vera, and they made the point of short, short distance, repeatable, and if it was in an industrial environment like a port or something like that, or even a, a local community that understood, oh, we've got autonomous delivery and everybody buys into it, you can start to mix, start to mix the environments. But I'm, I'm, really, I'm really excited to see, um, I, I think it's gotta, come, it's gotta come out of a place where somebody can make an autocratic decision about a bunch of vehicles. And that to me smacks of fleets of, fleets of vehicles, um, well-defined well -defined routes and, and so forth 
to do all of the, you, you can't, you can't allow it to go out into the consumer market and do what David Letterman used to call stupid human tricks. You can't have, you can't have the average human being just being who they are and just all of a sudden sense what the behaviors need to be to successfully use this. But I, I, I think it's gonna be uh, in those environments and um, we're learning how to do this with Uber. But I, I, I wanna protest right now. I was here on June 1st in Vegas when the place opened up and my ride from the airport was 13 bucks. Yesterday, same shorter ride and it was 22 bucks. So I doth protest. I'm gonna go back to standard taxi drivers. <laughs> Maybe not, it depends whichever's first. But, but, I, think, but I, think, I think that we're learning the behavior of the shared economy with Uber, Lyft and, and the others. And I know, um, the, the younger generations are absolutely bought in and they don't want, they, they, understand, they understand the, what do we see this morning, the six, uh, the five and, five and a half and six and hundred dollars a month, 71 months. My kids don't, they're in their early 20s, mid, mid 20s. They, they think about that. They don't want that. They don't want that burden. I think though you, you keep, so you keep saying you talk about the stupid human tricks and, and how people react, and I, I wonder, like, do the younger generations realize how much their behavior is going to have to change in order for this to move forward? Every time you said, like, people do stupid things, I just kept thinking about um, several years ago, several, several years ago, there was a story about a guy who put cru cruise control on his car when cruise were, and got up and walked to the back of his van and then was surprised when he had a wreck. Um, that, that aspect, the topic may change, the button may change, but that's just natural human behavior. It is. Behavior. It's, it's, it's human adoption and change and deciding, deciding who they are and so forth. But the population is huge now. Yeah. And the, the, um, and the, issue, the issue is who's investing the money in which parts of the value chain, like the question we just asked, what would you, what would you back off on? Does anyone else have, have thoughts on backing off? So um, j just wondered, as far as like the where, uh, where do you see the countries best? Um, I mean, you were asking for like where, in, in kind of the quick reaction in the US, there's parts of the East Coast and West Coast for electrification, uh, uh, aut autonomy that would make sense, but that's part of, you know, we got a divided country politically and going back and forth. So I wondered, do you, does the US lead the way in this? Are we sort of behind just uh, because we're, we're, we can't act really very well federally you, you could, in a consistent manner? You could hear my prejudice because I was very steeped in the telecommunications industry. And I watched us step on ourselves for decades, watching the international market run away with the, the standards on wireless technology. Um, and my, my concern is what, what you, just, you just stated is that um, if we can come up with credible models that can be demonstrated to work across at least reasonable portions of the population, uh, and we just leave it to completely free market forces, um, we're gonna be wallowing in this thing for decades to come. We have to come to, we have to, come to some rational recognition that joint planning, even amongst competitors, about deciding on standards and, and, and Paths, paths through the rollout of technology in a, in a rational fashion will get us somewhere much quicker um, instead of watching more constraint. Well, you look at, and I'll just take the telecommunications. Um, Singapore, country, world economic force, five million people, they're so far ahead in so much other technology. Why? Because they can make a decision Five million, five million people in the, in the US would not be considered a serious market segment. But over there, they can roll out and leapfrog because of the constraints of the population being fairly um, open to perhaps dictatorial ideas on what's going to work and what's not going to work in the country, and therefore leapfrog by making an investment that they can have predictability on how the uh, technology is gonna roll out and be adopted. It, it, it goes against our grain as Americans, but it's, an, it's a pretty interesting model to look at in terms of getting 
getting to the next, the next through the next disruption of technology. It's something to consider. How do we do similar things? I think we're already behind too. I mean, if you looked at his graph about electric vehicles and where we fall versus other countries, and we're at the very bottom with 1%, um, Americans are stubborn. <laughs> they like their way things the way they like it, and it's really hard to get them to shift over into a new way of thinking. And, and when, we see, when we see the technology working in a given environment, if we, if we pay attention to communicate, what about that environment was open to the acceptance for the, of the technology the way that it, it, it produced so that we don't blindly say, oh, well, it can work everywhere. The pieces of it can and say, okay, which in the next environment, which five of the 10 things that worked in the Amazon warehouse are applicable to my situation? What do I have to solve in addition? And rather than trying to solve those things unilaterally so that I'm first to market, so that I hopefully corner the market, get together with the, the ecosystem of colleagues and say, I'm gonna need to solve this. Let's solve it together so that we have a bigger market together later on. That's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. well. And cross industry, like there, there was someone talking about it yesterday, they showed the graph where all the circles started overlapping. Um, it's just like what you're saying about you're gonna have to get together with other people to problem solve all of these different things because once you start moving in this direction, you're not just touching one segment anymore, one industry, one anything. You're, you're crossing into a bunch of different sectors. Yeah, hundred percent. And I just want to be collaborative with our host. We're like seven minutes over. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, any any last question before we wrap up the session? I this is really great. I've got a great new friend in Texas, um, in in the industry, and th really thanks very much for participating. Any last words, Melanie? No, thank you. This has been an incredible couple of days. Um, I'm so impressed with the group of people that I'm around and who I've met. So you're all so brilliant. I don't, I don't feel like I have anything smarter to say than any of you, so. Thanks much. Thank you.